I'll start the story back in around 1982. Um, this is a picture of Richard Feynman. Richard Feynman was a brilliant theoretical physicist, and um, in, in the early 80s, Feynman made an observation, um, which was not particularly deep, but he took it to a very interesting place. Feynman observed that if you take quantum systems in nature, uh, systems of electrons, quarks, atoms, molecules, and you try to simulate them on a classical computer, um, and in fact, in those days, all we had was classical computers, um, these simulations were painfully slow. In fact, they were so slow that really uh, all but the smallest quantum systems cannot really be simulated effectively. So Feynman thought about this, uh, and instead of thinking of this as a problem or a challenge, Feynman sort of turned it around and he saw an opportunity here. He said, well, if nature is able to so easily evolve systems of interacting quantum uh, degrees of freedom, but we have such a hard time doing that on classical computers, then perhaps what that means is that the building blocks that nature has available to it are more powerful than the building blocks we use when we build digital logic. And so that started a lot of people thinking about this question, you know, can you actually build a different kind of a computer um, using building blocks that are more like the quantum building blocks that nature has available to it? So um, after a period of time, there was sort of a consensus that, that yes, perhaps we can think about a new kind of computer and this, this building block that we would use to build these computers, instead of being a bit, it's now gonna be a quantum bit, which is what we today call a qubit. Um, so a lot of people, when they, when they hear about this, they'll say, well, okay, so what is a qubit? Is it just a, is it a spinning atom? What is it? And um, the real answer is a qubit is not a particular physical thing in nature. A qubit is a mathematical model. So I don't know if this analogy helps you, but in the physics world, you know, anything that vibrates classically, we can think of as being like a simple harmonic oscillator. Uh, it, it, it could be a, an electrical circuit with oscillating current. It could be a, a structural beam that is vibrating. It could be a sound wave in some gas, but all of those can be modeled as just uh, you know, a, a wave which is bouncing back and forth. Well, in the quantum world, the same thing is true. When you have a quantum system that has got two levels to it, two energy levels, you can say that is a, a qubit. Um, and it could, it could be, uh, there are many different physical ways of building a qubit. So on this slide here, uh, these are three pursuits or three options that are being pursued by different companies today. Uh, on the left, superconducting loops. This is what D-Wave uses to build our quantum computers. Um, it's also what IBM uses, what Rigetti uses. And the notion here with a superconducting loop is you can put a little bit of current through the loop in one direction, you can put a little bit of current in the other direction, and those represent the two states of your qubit. Um, you can also trap an ion. This is what another company called IonQ is doing uh, in the east coast of the US. Microsoft is pursuing a fairly exotic approach, which is called topological matter. They actually try to represent uh, the states of a qubit using the braiding patterns of particles as they move through space and time. So the bottom line is there are lots of ways that you can build a qubit, and it's in a sense you can think of that as being an engineering choice. You know, if, you're, if your goal is to build a system with, with a certain number of qubits and certain noise characteristics, What's the correct choice to make here? And if you like a historical analogy, um, it's sort of like at a point in time, you could have imagined building a digital computer using vacuum tubes or relays or you know, other, other physical implementations of simple logic gates. So um, we sort of understood this much by say the late 80s or the early 90s. But then uh, the question, the next question is sort of, how do you organize a set of qubits into a computational device? And by around the early 90s, um, this thing had evolved that I will call the standard model of quantum computing. 
And uh, it's, it's referred to sometimes as the gate model or the circuit model. Um, the difference between saying gate model and circuit model is just that a circuit is built out of a bunch of gates. So what you're seeing here is um, a circuit diagram for a particular simple uh, quantum circuit. And it's, it's a little bit different from a circuit diagram for uh, uh, you know, a digital circuit that you might put on a chip. So here's how you read this kind of circuit diagram. First of all, each one of the horizontal lines here represents a qubit. So if you count, there are nine horizontal lines here. So this is a nine qubit circuit. Um, so that means you would have nine of those little superconducting loops that you saw on the last uh, page or, you know, nine of those little uh, spinning atoms or whatever. So uh, the first very surprising thing about qubits is that um, when you put multiple qubits together, the way you have to describe a system composed of multiple qubits, uh, it sort of explodes exponentially. You can't describe a nine qubit system like this by providing independent descriptions of each of the nine qubits. So in fact, if you have a system of n qubits, the way you have to describe the state of that system is by actually writing down a list of numbers. You can think of that as a vector, if you wish. And the size of that vector is 2 to the power n. So in this case here, these 9 qubits, to represent the state of those 9 qubits, you would actually need a vector of size uh, 2 to the ninth, or 512. So the way you actually think about this circuit here is um, time goes from left to right. And so you initialize the state of the qubits, or you know, mathematically speaking, you actually initialize that big vector of 512 numbers. You initialize it to a particular starting uh, vector. And then as time goes from left to right, you encounter these gates. And the gates are these vertical lines. And each gate sits on top of, or it hits, maybe two or three qubits. And so what that means is you're literally applying a transformation that uh, transforms uh, those two qubits. And that transformation sort of acts in parallel over all the possible states of the other qubits that are not involved in that gate. So that's kind of a, an abstract description. And in fact, if you want to think of what actually happens mathematically here, each of these gates actually can be represented as just a big matrix that multiplies that vector. So um, if you count up in this, uh, in this little circuit here, there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. There's about 10 gates here. And so that means that you're taking this initial vector and multiplying it sequentially by 10 big matrices of size 512 by 512. And then at the end, you get one final vector, and then you make some measurement on it. So this is kind of the standard model that had emerged by, you know, probably around the early 90s. And uh, so this is, this is the circuit or gate model of quantum computing. Well, now that this model had, had sort of emerged, the, the next uh, big question was, Feynman had an intuition. Feynman's intuition was that we should be able to do very powerful computations using these new quantum building blocks, but we still did not have an example that actually showed that this was possible. And so Peter Shore, in a sense, answered this question. He supplied this missing example in about 1994. And Peter Shore, who was at the time a mathematician at Bell Labs, showed that factoring uh, factoring integers, which is a very hard problem, can actually be done quickly and efficiently using this model of a quantum computer. So Peter Shore combined a little bit of uh, number theory, and uh, the, the, the thing that he did with a quantum computer here is, is actually kind of interesting. A quantum computer actually has a very easy time doing what's called a, a Fourier transform. Um, and you can actually call it a QFT if you want. If you look at the circuit diagram here on the upper right, you can see that we've got QFT. It's actually an inverse QFT. 
Um, and that QFT happens to sit on three qubit lines here. So that means that uh, the quantum Fourier transform is an eight by eight matrix. And I've actually shown, I've actually drawn out the eight by eight matrix here. And each of those numbers omega inside that matrix is actually an eighth root of unity. So Peter Shore showed that using a little number theory and uh, a fairly simple circuit for a gate model quantum computer, you can factor quickly and efficiently. And so this was a dramatic, dramatic discovery. It really kind of energized the field because, you know, it said suddenly this, this abstract computational device now you got to remember in 1994, nobody had built a quantum computer. This was just an abstract theoretical thing that people were imagining. The idea was if we could build it, we could solve factoring. And you know, I'm sure you probably know this, but most of the encryption that that our modern uh, you know infrastructure, internet infrastructure sits on top of uses the difficulty of factoring as a guarantee to keep you know secrets safe. So this would be a dramatic event if we could actually implement this. But there's a big problem associated with, with this approach, and I'm sort of trying to explain the problem with this, this uh, sort of graphic here, waves and noise. So when you look at this picture, you can see some coherent phenomena. Um, you can see four, about four big waves coming into the shore and, and crashing on the shore. So you know, if you studied waves in physics, you know that waves uh, have this coherence property to them, which means they've got a phase. The wave can be at, a, at, its, uh, at, at its highest or at its lowest. And if two waves come together, they can interfere with each other and they can interfere to reinforce each other. Uh, so that would be constructive interference or they can uh, effectively uh, interfere to destroy each other. That's destructive interference. And that would be if the phases of the two waves are, are uh, out of phase, so to speak. So in a very real sense, when you uh, are building a quantum circuit, like I showed you on the last slide, what you're doing is harnessing uh, this wave action. Because every time you take one of those big vectors and multiply it by a matrix, that matrix is going to combine together numbers in that big vector. And so the combination of those numbers can reinforce the numbers or it can cause the numbers to cancel each other out. So in a very real sense, you're using coherent wave behavior when you pass this vector through these quantum gates. But there's something competing against that coherent wave behavior, and that's all the noise that you see here. Now, I'm not talking about audio noise. What I'm talking about is everything that you see on the surface of the water that's like the little ripples, the bubbles, you know, the, the droplets of water going in the air, everything that's not like a smooth laminar wave, that's what I'm calling noise. And so you can imagine that you know if you have sort of the you know the pure smooth laminar wave versus noise if you add more and more and more noise into that wave behavior then you can eventually swamp the waves entirely and so all that nice coherent uh, uh destructive and constructive interference that the waves can can do you could wipe it out with noise so this is a big, big problem in quantum computing because um, when you try to build, you know, superconducting circuits or trapped ions or, you know, topological matter or whatever, there's always going to be noise in your system. And if that noise overwhelms the coherent wave activity, your quantum computer is not going to work. So that brings us kind of like the, to the next big question, which is, can you mitigate this noise? Can you deal with it? So it turns out that, again, a bunch of smart people started thinking about this problem in the mid-90s. And um, the answer, uh, it turns out that the answer is yes. And this may not be too surprising. If you've spent any time looking at classical logic, you know that there is a very, very well-developed uh, understanding of how to correct errors in classical logic. You know, if you have a, a memory chip storing bits and a cosmic ray hits that memory chip, then it's easy for a cosmic ray to actually flip a bit. 
So if you have a 32-bit word in a classical computer and suddenly one of those memory bits has been flipped by, you know, a cosmic ray or something else, can you figure out how to recover from that? And the answer is yes. Um, there's, you know, one, one uh, phrase you may have heard is SECDED. It stands for Single Error Correct Double Error Detect. So this is something that is, uh, it can be implemented pretty easily in classical logic. And so the presence of things like that in the classical world sort of suggests, yes, we ought to be able to do that in the quantum world too. And so a bunch of smart people applied themselves to this problem. And um, indeed, uh, Peter Shore and some other people showed that, yes, there are certain kinds of errors or noise in quantum systems that you can correct for um, by sort of adding additional qubits to your, your base system. But that's, so that's good news, obviously, but there is bad news associated with this as well, which is that um, the overhead associated with this error correction looks very steep in the quantum world. So to give you sort of a, a reference point, if you go back to the classical world, and you look at a 32-bit word in a, you know, a regular computer, you can ask the question, how many additional bits would it take to perform this single error correct and double error de detect on a 32-bit classical word? And the number of extra bits is fairly small. It's around seven bits. So seven overhead bits for 32 data bits is an acceptable overhead. But in the quantum case, this overhead looks much higher. So at the bottom of the slide, um, I'm quoting three results here, one by Gottesman, who suggests that more than 100 physical qubits may be required to mimic the behavior of one error-free logical qubit. So that's a 100 to 1. That's much, much, much worse than 7 to 32. And then the other two results I quote here are uh, some analyses done on particular quantum algorithms that you might want to run on a gate model quantum computer. So in the case of uh, this uh, Fowler, he, he looked at an atomic and molecular calculation of a particular uh, molecule, iron sulfide, 112 orbitals, and that might have required, you know, according to his analysis, 27 uh, million physical qubits. O'Gorman uh, analyzed uh, Shor's algorithm for factoring on a 1,000-bit number, and he said that that would require on the order of 173 million physical qubits. So these are important numbers to keep in mind when you look at where we are today with gate model quantum computers. So this is kind of the end of chapter one of my little story here. Um, and the next chapter starts in the late 90s. So this chapter kind of begins with um, a, a Japanese physicist, uh, Nishimori. You see his picture in the upper right here. Nishimori made a very interesting um, observation. There is a physical process that we have used for literally hundreds of years, which is called annealing. Annealing is uh, a, a process of taking a very, very complicated system. It's got a very complicated energy landscape and allowing that system to explore the energy landscape in order to find uh, good or low points in the energy landscape. The way that we have been doing annealing for literally hundreds of years is using thermal energy. So thermal annealing is literally what you're doing when, uh, when a blacksmith takes a piece of iron he puts it in a furnace, he heats it up, and that thermal energy allows the little domains inside uh, the, the iron to actually reorient themselves. And then you can cool it down and the iron has much better structural properties. So Nishimori's um, insight was perhaps we can use annealing, uh, except instead of using thermal energy, we're going to use quantum fluctuations. So now instead of thermal annealing, we're talking about quantum annealing. Nishimori suggested this um, as, a, uh, as a sort of a theoretical construct. He didn't actually uh, build anything in the lab. So on the left side of the slide, now you see Gabe Apley. Apley actually, uh, is, he's a lab guy. He actually built a spin system 
and he used quantum annealing. He was able to cleverly turn up the quantum fluctuations and then turn them back down in a particular spin system. And he observed that that did a very good job of allowing the system of spins to find a low energy state. And so then building on that work, some physicists at MIT, Seth Lloyd, uh, William Kaminsky, and then there were a few others that followed on to this work, they actually created um, as circuit diagrams for superconducting circuits that would be programmable annealing engines. So this was really the beginning of this kind of second chapter of, uh, of quantum computing. Now, the picture that makes it kind of easy to, to talk about what really happens in annealing is here, here's a landscape. So this is to be explicit, this is a two-dimensional landscape where we've got latitude and longitude. And then at every latitude longitude point, we have some kind of height. So you can think of height as a function of latitude and longitude. And we're just representing some, some mountains here. And the blue puddles in the mountains are obviously where water has collected. So those are low points in our landscape. So you can think of uh, quantum annealing now as a new mechanism to find low points on a landscape. Now, I guess I should say, finding a low point on a landscape does not really seem like it's a computation. But in fact, pretty much any computation that we can do classically can be transformed into this format. So as a simple example, suppose I have two numbers, x and y, and I want to multiply them together to get another number, z. Can I actually convert that problem into a landscape like this? And the answer is yes. All you have to do is write down a formula. You've got x and y and z, and you want x times y to equal z. So if I write down a little formula that says x times y minus z equals, let's call it discrepancy for d. If that discrepancy equals 0, then I know that x times y minus z equals 0. And so z is the product of x and y. But if d is non-zero, then I've got some kind of discrepancy. And so z is no longer the product of x and y. So it's easy to turn that equation into a landscape like this just by taking x, y minus z and squaring it. The squaring operation just has the property of converting a negative discrepancy into a positive discrepancy. So the, uh, it, it's OK if you didn't follow the example, but the key point is that anything we can do in classical logic, using a few tricks like that, you can convert it into a landscape problem like this. And so the conclusion is, if you can find low points in a landscape, then that's actually a very powerful computational technique. OK? And so how does quantum annealing help you in a situation like this? Well, classically, if I ask you to find a low point in this landscape, kind of the, the, the basic algorithm would be to first pick a random uh, location, you know, pick a random latitude and longitude, and look at what your height is, and then look in your immediate vicinity, your neighborhood. Do you want to move north or south or east or west? Which of those moves would decrease your height most rapidly? So then you pick that direction, you take a step in that direction, and then you do that same thing over again and over again, and over again. So all you're doing is you're heading downhill as quickly as you can. That's called gradient descent. And gradient descent is a well-known technique for finding low points in a landscape. Now, the challenge with gradient descent is it's guaranteed to find you a minima, but not necessarily the global minima. If you want to actually find a global minima, you have to allow yourself sometimes to walk uphill so that you can get yourself out of little valleys. Um, so that's called simulated annealing. But the idea, though, is there are techniques for finding low points in a landscape classically. So how would you do this quantumly now? Well, it turns out that in the quantum world, you can actually use qubits to represent your latitude and your longitude. And since these qubits can be in this superposition state, since they can be a little bit zero and a little bit one at the same time, what that translates into is you're not now living in 
in the landscape at one point. You're actually in a fog-like state spread over the entire landscape. And so literally you can think of that as the quantum wave function. It's a fog spread over this landscape. Now, as we go through the annealing cycle, it turns out two things will happen, and I'll make contact with that in a, just another couple of slides. Two things will happen. One is that cloud, that quantum cloud will condense down to a point, and the mountains and the valleys of the landscape will emerge. We'll actually start with a flat landscape, and then we'll effectively turn up the mountains and turn up the valleys. So as the quantum cloud condenses down to one point, and the landscape emerges, that quantum cloud slides downhill and it ends up in a minima of the landscape. So that's the difference between using sort of a, a sort of a classical approach to finding a low point in a landscape and the quantum approach. Now, that background was sort of understood by around, say, the year 2000, 2002, somewhere in there. And that's around the time that D-Wave as a company was born. D-Wave came to life 20 years ago, 1999, and for the first few years of life of D-Wave, we actually were not intent on building a quantum computer. The initial phase of the company was more focused on acquiring intellectual property around quantum, and that lasted for around five years, but um, at around the point 2004, the company underwent, you know, a phase transition, if you will. Uh, the, the founders of the company decided that at that point there was enough understanding of this new model of quantum computing, the annealing model, and technology was advanced to the point where, you know, it probably made sense to actually try to do something uh, in this space. And so in around 2004, D-Wave made this technology agnostic evaluation of whether we want to try to build a gate model machine or an annealing machine and whether we want to use superconducting circuits or trapped ions or something else. And so around 2004, we decided, yes, we do want to build a quantum computer. And after this uh, technology agnostic evaluation, we decided we're going to use superconducting circuits and we're going to build an annealing machine. And so what you're seeing here is actually some pictures from the inside of our, our current generation system. On the left side of the picture, you see the outside can of a so-called pulse tube dilution refrigerator. And if you take out that can and, and then all the other cans inside it, you'll expose the assembly that you see in the middle here. Uh, you can also see the temperatures uh, that we dropped down to 50 Kelvin, that's uh, roughly liquid nitrogen, 4 Kelvin is roughly uh, liquid helium, and the, then to get colder than liquid helium, you have to actually use both the <laughs> both isotopes of helium, helium-3 and helium-4, and you can get down to uh, about uh, you know 10 or 15 millikelvin, which is more than 100 times colder than deep space. And then there's the processor that lives down at the bottom of that assembly, and you can see the processor, uh, the chip itself, in its holder on the right side of the slide. So this is kind of where we started going uh, in 2004, but it's worth remembering that it took a long time to get there. So the gap between uh, our decision to build a superconducting quantum annealer and when we actually first delivered one to our first customer, that was a seven year uh, period of, of uh, very active development and engineering. So in 2011, our first generation system we introduced, the D-Wave 1, and you can see a diagram of the qubits and the couplers. I'll talk about the qubits and couplers a little bit more on the next slide, but that uh, first generation system uh, you know, was purchased by Lockheed, it was housed at the University of Southern California, and uh, that was a 128 qubit system. And then two years later, uh, we introduced the D-Wave 2, uh, Lockheed upgraded to that system. That system had 512 qubits, uh, 1,400 couplers. Two years later, uh, we introduced the D-Wave 2X, uh, 1,152 qubits, 3,300 couplers. Uh, Google had purchased the D-Wave 2. Google upgraded to the 2X. Uh, Lockheed also upgraded to the 2X. 
And then uh, in 2017, we introduced our fourth generation product, uh, the D-Wave 2000Q, and the 2000Q has 2048 qubits and 6000 couplers. And again, if you look at these pictures, each one of the little uh, gray balls represents a qubit, and the lines between them represent the couplers in the system. Okay, so what does this really mean? So what I've got on this slide is two different equations. One of them represents the classical programming model that's on the bottom of the slide. And the equation at the top of the slide represents the quantum programming model. Now, it's important to point out that the first three generations of our system, uh, the only thing that we really allowed users access to is the classical optimization problem. That's that bottom equation. But when we introduced the 2000Q, we also uh, effectively opened up access to the equation that you see on the top of the slide, the quantum Hamiltonian. So what are these two equations and, and how do you think about them? Um, well, for starters, the bottom equation uh, is, is just a simple equation between numbers. The objective on the left-hand side of the slide is, you should think of that as being that um, landscape that I showed you a few slides back. Um, the landscape, though, to be a little bit more accurate, is not a two-dimensional landscape. You, you should not think of it as having latitude and longitude. Instead, the landscape, um, the coordinates of the landscape are a series of Boolean variables that I've labeled here QI and QJ. So that I, J uh, uh, subscript um, in our 2000Q system, for example, it would go from I equals one up to I equals 2000. And so what you're seeing on the right-hand side of that equality is an equation where Qs represent points in the landscape and A's and B's represent parameters that the user or programmer chooses and the A's and B's determine the landscape. Okay, so um, in the 2000Q, uh, where we've got 2000 qubits, each qubit has an AI associated with it. So that's a set of 2000 knobs. And then the BIJs are the couplers, and there's 6,000 of those. So literally, as the programmer, you have you know a total of about 8,000 of these numbers, the A's and the B's, that you get to play with to create the landscape. And then once you've created the landscape, the system is going to find the QI values that give you low points in the landscape. So this is purely a classical optimization problem. And that's what people did on the D-Wave 1 and the D-Wave 2 and the D-Wave 2X. But now, if you look at the equation on the top, this shows you that there's actually a lot more uh, sort of power or flexibility in what you can do on the 2000Q. The A, I, and the B, I, J coefficients uh, sort of get transported directly up into the, the, the uh, the top equation. You can see the AIs and the BIJs, but all of the QIs now have turned into these so-called sigma IZs, which I've labeled longitudinal fields. And whereas the, the uh, QIs were just Boolean variables that would assume the value plus one or minus one, or maybe zero, one, now when we go up to the, the top equation, these sigmas are not just numbers. They're actually uh, operators or little two by two matrices. And in fact, there's a lot of hidden tensor products in here. So when you actually multiply this, all these sigma out, these sigmas out, this thing that you get up here on the right hand side of this top equation is not just a number, it's actually a ginormous uh, matrix. It's a matrix of size two to the n by two to the n. And everything that you see in the square brackets on the right hand side of that equation, you see B of S multiplied by this, this term in square brackets, that's what you can think of as being the energy landscape. It's the potential energy of, of our system. But the stuff that you see on uh, multiplying the A of S, that transverse field term, that represents the quantum fluctuations because the sigma x is also um, a so-called operator. It's a little two by two matrix that causes the qubit values or the spins to flip back and forth. So as we go through our annealing cycle, these, these two different kinds of terms, the transverse field terms and the longitudinal field terms are modulated 
by these two functions, A of S and B of S, these so-called envelope or interpolating weighting functions that you see in the little graph there, <clears throat> you can see that the A of S function, which uh, determines the strength of the quantum fluctuations, starts high and then drops off as we go through our annealing cycle. And then the B of S uh, interpolating weighting function starts off low and it, uh, and it grows, it ramps up. And that's exactly what I was talking about when I said earlier that the quantum fluctuations are turned down as we go through our annealing cycle. That corresponds to A of S getting smaller and smaller. And then the landscape, which is the B of S term, that gets turned up as we go through the annealing cycle. So again, that's a lot of quantum, uh, sort of quantum physics that, that may not you know, resonate with you very much if you haven't spent time looking at Hamiltonians. But the real point I'm trying to make here is you can approach our system either as though it's solving a classical optimization problem, and that's where you kind of start with the lower equation, or if you're interested in actually modeling a quantum system, you can use the top equation if you're kind of prepared to deal with the additional complexity that comes about from actually you know, dealing with a quantum Hamiltonian. Just wanted to kind of lay out a couple of vocabulary words here. <clears throat> So for, for the objective function, again, this is the uh, bottom equation from the last slide. The objective function has this very simple form here. Um, and sometimes you'll hear it referred to as a QBO, Q-U-B-O. That stands for quadratic unconstrained binary optimization. So B for binary means these Q variables can take zero, one values, or maybe plus one minus values. O for optimization means we're trying to find the minimum of this function here. And in, in fact, you, you could actually find maxima as well if you just multiply the whole thing by, by a minus one. And then the vocabulary words here are, we can refer to the AIs as being weights. Each qubit has a weight associated with it. And there's a simple way to understand how the weight influences the behavior of a qubit. If a weight is positive, the qubit wants to turn off. If a weight is negative, the qubit wants to turn on. So this is kind of the starting point for classical optimization. Now, from a programmer's point of view, there's generally like three kinds of problems that people seem to be trying to map to the D-Wave system. Optimization problems, machine learning problems, and material simulation problems. So I've just put a, kind of a smattering of them here. In the optimization category, NASA, for example, has lots of scheduling applications. You know, if you have a satellite up in uh, space, a satellite has a huge number of functional parts on it, and you need to control the behavior of those parts, but there's a lot of parts that can't be uh, actuated at the same time. So you can convert that into a kind of a scheduling problem and then map that into this Cubo uh, equation that I showed you on the last slide. Volkswagen has taken problems like optimizing traffic flow and converting them into a Cubo. And then uh, this, this last example in the optimization category is particularly striking because I, I think it's something that nobody in the scientific world would, uh, would ever have thought of. When you actually put ads in a web browser, there's an optimization problem that you solve there because you're spending money to put, ad, to put ads in the browser. So you want to put ads in uh, browsers that are being shown to people that are likely to buy your product, but you don't want to spend more money than you have to. So that's a very interesting optimization problem, and that can be converted into one of these cubos and mapped onto the D-Wave system. Machine learning is another area of active research. Um, I mentioned a couple of uh, pieces of work, one from Google called QBoost, another one from Los Alamos. And then the third category, material simulation, this is work that has just happened more recently um, because this actually requires using some of these more advanced features on the 2000Q that were not present in the first three generations of our system. So I'll showcase a few of these uh, uh, applications. This one here came out of um, Britain. It's actually uh, a scheduling problem where you're actually trying to build uh, 
grocery carts. People are uh, ordering online groceries. You've got a big warehouse that you can see in this picture here, and you've got these robots moving along a square grid on top of all these bins that contain products like paper towels and toothpaste and bananas. So somebody says, I want you know a shopping cart. Here are the items I want in the shopping cart. And you've got to schedule a robot to go and pick up all those items and deliver it into a shopping cart. So clearly, this is an optimization problem. Um, Ocado, which is this online uh, grocer, uh, grocery store, worked with the Hartree Center, which has some expertise in programming the D-Wave system, and they came up with a very interesting, uh, you know, mapping of this optimization problem onto uh, a Cubo. So this is an example of kinds of optimization problems we see people solving. Here's a machine learning problem. Uh, this comes from the medical world. The notion is it's possible to actually create the so-called Markov networks. So what you're seeing here is a set of nodes. Each node contains uh, a piece of information which you may or may not know about a patient. And then there are linkages between these nodes. So this Markov network, you know, once you uh, have a chance to sit down with a patient and find out what symptoms they're experiencing, and then you can do some lab work and maybe get some other information through the lab work, it allows you to fill in certain, uh, certain of these nodes in a Markov network. And then the rest of the nodes need to be filled in in a way that makes the, the, uh, the overall probability of values in the network most most likely. And so that can be done again using a kind of a machine learning approach. And so this is a very interesting medical diagnostic application that, that kind of fits in that machine learning category. And then the uh, third example I want to talk about is, is more in this material simulation uh, category. This is different work that was done by Volkswagen. Um, a team of three researchers there looked at a very simple toy problem. How do you actually compute uh, ground state energies of uh, molecular hydrogen as a function of the inter interatomic distance between the nuclei? And so you can see uh, some successive approximations here that, that are doing a better and better job of actually mimicking the uh, analytically known solution for this hydrogen molecule. This is a simple enough problem so that you can actually solve it very well on a classical computer, but it indicates that you actually might be able to do similar things for bigger industrially relevant molecules on, uh, on a quantum system like ours. Um, so let me shift gears now and talk a little bit about where we're going, where D-Wave is going. I've shown you the first four generations of the D-Wave system, and they've all had the same uh, topology, effectively. Topology so simply means which qubits are connected to which other qubits. And what I'm showing you here on the right side of the slide is the eight qubits uh, inside the unit cell of our current chimera topology. And so in this picture, I'm actually representing each qubit as a elongated skinny blue bar. So instead of being a big round loop, uh, superconducting loop, it, it's actually a very long skinny loop. And so you can see that we've oriented four qubits horizontally and four qubits vertically. And at each of the 16 locations where the qubits cross over each other, that's where we can put a little additional circuitry that implements a coupler. So that's our old topology, the Chimera topology. Now we've received a lot of input from customers that suggests that having a denser set of connections amongst our qubits would make it much more powerful. And so with our next generation machine, which we will announce next year in 2020, we have substantially beefed up the topology. And so we are now going from what, what I call, or what we call the Chimera topology, to this Pegasus topology. So now you can see right away that instead of just having um, eight qubits in the unit cell, we have a much bigger unit cell. We actually have 12 horizontal qubits and 12 vertical qubits. So there's a lot more connectivity right there. But we also make some other changes. Um, if you look along the right and the bottom edge, you'll now see a new set of these little uh, yellow circles that are so-called odd couplers. And these are new couplers that we placed into the Pegasus topology that were not present 
in the chimera topology. And these couplers actually mean that we have a substantially more efficient uh, embedding of logical problems into the physical uh, qubits of our system. So that's the second big change. And then the third uh, very interesting change is we actually shift the qubits so that instead of living entirely within one unit cell, the qubits live partially in one unit cell and partially in the neighboring unit cell. So if you look here, you see that I've taken the top four qubits and I've slid them horizontally to the right a little bit. <clears throat> so these qubits, these four horizontal qubits have lost eight couplers on their left edge, but they've picked up eight couplers on their right side into the neighboring unit cell, which I'm, which I'm not picturing here. And so this actually is a nice way of spreading out the couplers and it, and it makes the connectivity sort of have a longer reach. And it, again, it improves our ability to map logical problems into this physical connectivity of qubits. And this turned out to be such a good idea that we actually do a lot of it. We shift those qubits uh, more, the bottom qubits, and then we also shift the vertical qubits so that by the time we're, we're finished applying all these shifts, the notion of the unit cell has sort of almost been atomized or destroyed because all of these uh, qubits now are partially in one unit cell and partially in another unit cell. So we're starting to build uh, chips with this topology right now and it looks like it's a much more powerful uh, architecture than the one we've been using for the last four generations. So uh, one other thing that I'd like to talk about, and this is kind of even further into the future, is the possibility of changing the fundamental circuit that we're using uh, to implement our qubits and our couplers. And the idea here, this is a, this is a piece of work that was just uh, put into the public domain a couple of months ago. The idea is to include new kinds of circuit elements that will actually make uh, our system more powerful in terms of being able to find uh, low points in the landscape here. So this is kind of for experts, but I want to put the slide up here just to point out that we are actually making a lot of progress in terms of uh, uh, getting our system closer to what uh, is thought of as a universal quantum computer. So the last couple of slides, I want to just uh, uh, point you guys to our cloud environment. Um, we've got a new uh, site that we've introduced last year that we call Leap. It's our quantum application cloud access environment. Um, you can actually get a free minute uh, per month. You can access a quantum computer over the internet via cloud. There's open source uh, software development kit that you can download and uh, there's demos, reference code, community support, online training available. And so I encourage you to go to the website, check this out. It's, it's a really uh, cool experience. Um, the the software model that we're presenting to people is a so-called Ocean software, which is a Python API. It's a very powerful set of tools in Python for formulating the so-called cubos. And if you're from the physics world, you might know that when I say cubo, I mean my QI variables are zeros and ones. If you're from the physics world, uh, you know that that's uh, equivalent to an Ising problem where your cubo variables now become plus one minus one variables. Um, and most of the Ocean software you can actually download uh, from GitHub or you can do a pip install if you're uh, used to the Python environment. And so this is absolutely um, a situation where we're looking for, you know, uh, support from the community and for people to uh, come up with new, uh, new kinds of tools and applications built on top of this. And um, there's some other exciting new work that uh, we're also um, trying to package up and get out into the user community. It's evol it's, it's, it revolves around taking problems that are too big to fit on the chip and decomposing them so that you can actually do some classical work to decompose your, your large problem into QPU sized chunks and then running those QPU sized chunks on the QPU itself and then putting those answers back together. So that's a new package that we're calling D-Wave Hybrid. Um, 
and we think it's going to be very relevant for industrial problems, which are which are literally very very large. So uh, that's really what I wanted to cover, and uh, I'll stop here and let's see what kind of questions we've got. Thank you very much. Great, thanks, Denny. Uh, we've answered a lot of questions during the webinar today, but we do have some that we've marked to uh, be asked of you. So here I go. What kind of isolation, for example, metals or fluids, are used to avoid noise from the environment around the D-Wave system to keep it working without errors? Sure. Um, I'm going to pop back to this picture here. So there are many different kinds of isolation. Um, first one is we run our system at very cold temperatures. and uh, you know, Temperature means heat, heat means thermal fluctuations, so that's a primary source of noise, which we can uh, mitigate or reduce greatly by running at these very, very cold temperatures. So 15 millikelvin, like I said, is roughly a couple of hundred times colder than interstellar space. So that's one technique. Second one is we run our system in a pretty hard vacuum. Um, in fact, you can't really get down to these temperatures without doing that because our atmosphere freezes at these temperatures. So we pump it down to a hard vacuum. We, uh, we, cool, we cool it down like this. We do vibration isolation as well. Um, and in fact, when we install our systems, typically what we'll do is we'll sort of uh, carve out a little pad in the foundation of a building and re-pour a little bit of concrete, maybe about 10 by 10 feet, and maybe about eight or 10 inches thick that provides vibration insulation. And then there's a lot of electromagnetic shielding. The box that you see, the big black box, if you've seen pictures of our system, that actually provides a lot of layers of uh, shielding from background electromagnetic fields. We also shield uh, static magnetic fields like the Earth's magnetic field using active uh, uh, magnetic field generators on the surface of the chip itself. So there are many, many different ways that we, we uh, reduce the noise and, and coupling to things that would introduce uh, you know, uh, imperfections in the computation. Okay, thank you. Next question. Is the control of A and B parameters open to the programmer in order to control pausing, reversing, et cetera, in the annealing schedule? Yes. And the answer to that question uh, became yes only with the 2000Q. So that's kind of the technical, uh, the next level of technical detail. The A of S and B of S curves that you see here with the 2000Q, you can actually specify um, points in this so-called ST plane, and then our system software will automatically uh, create a piecewise linear fit of the points that you specify. So you can do all kinds of exotic things. You can pause in the middle of the anneal cycle. You can actually uh, go from the end of the anneal cycle backwards into the quantum regime. So that would be called a reverse anneal. And more exotic ideas are have been you know talked about. You could actually imagine kind of a sawtooth, uh, sort of a sawtooth anneal, which would kind of be similar to what people do in the gate model world when they do uh, QAOA, Q A O A for quantum approximate optimization algorithm. Yeah, so there's a lot of flexibility in playing with these anneal curves. Okay, are the error correcting qubits that you referenced inclusive or exclusive to the qubit? counts that you were talking about. So in other words, the 2,000 uh, qubits, does that include error correcting qubits? Um, the, I, I, guess, I guess the thing that I should say here is uh, back on this slide, when I'm talking about error correction and I'm giving logical qubit counts and physical qubit counts, this is particular to the gate model world. So this does not really translate over into the annealing model, which is what we do. The annealing model has a very, very different uh, set of characteristics when you look at the way it behaves with noise. One thing I'll say about the gate model is the gate model systems have a large number of different energy levels because each qubit would have two energy levels and then you've got a whole set of qubits so it, you end up with actually two to the n energy levels and you're trying to maintain a superposition state across all those different states at once in the gate model systems. So anything that can cause a dissipative uh, uh, decay from one of those higher levels down to a ground state causes noise for a gate model system. 
Annealing systems are very different. Annealing systems attempt to stay in their ground state through the entire computation. And so annealing systems are much more tolerant and resistant to noise than gate model systems are. So when I talk about 2,000 qubits for the D-Wave system, there's no sense in which those 2,000 qubits are divided into data qubits and error correcting qubits. All 2,000 of those qubits are available to represent uh, states in the uh, landscape. And so there, there is no division uh, in that sense in, a, in an annealing platform. Okay, thank you. How sensitive is the system to the implementation errors in the bias and coupling coefficients in the problem Hamiltonian? Ooh, excellent question. Um, so the, uh, just to sort of decode that, these AIs and BIJs, these are the numbers that the programmer uh, gives to the computer. That's how the programmer defines the landscape. And so one way to think about your question is, if AI wants to be a number like 2.39522, and you program that value in for a particular A, does the system really represent that 2.35 dot dot dot, or does it just get close to there? And the answer is this is this is something that, you know, we get as close as we can to that, but we know that we're not exact. And so certain kinds of problems are more sensitive to that misspecification than other kinds of problems are. And from generation to generation, we constantly sort of measure how much misspecification our circuit imposes on a user-defined problem. And we figure out engineering approaches to actually mitigate that and decrease that misspecification error. So that's a big thing that we work on you know, as we're engineering new generations of the system. Okay, this, I'm just going down through. We only have a few more minutes um, to look at some of these other questions. We'll try to answer some via email. Here's a question. How do you estimate the runtime of an algorithm beforehand, given that the runtime depends on the energy gaps in the problem Hamiltonian? Aha, okay, so uh, this, is a, this, this is a kind of a deep, technical question. So the problem gaps, um, what the question is referring to is, if you look at this equation here on the top of the slide, as I said earlier, this is actually an operator. Um, the Hamiltonian is an operator. And operators have eigenvalues. And so one uh, way that you can analyze the performance of an annealing algorithm is to track these eigenvalues as a function of this annealing parameter s. And it's known that there are certain uh, portions of this annealing trajectory where the gaps between the ground state and the first excited state and the second excited state, those gaps get very small. And so um, the, the, uh, the theoretical uh, understanding of uh, annealing and uh, the adiabatic algorithm from the physics world says that in those regions where the gaps get very small, you should slow your annealing down. And in fact, there, there are theoretical estimates that say the annealing rate should go as one over the gap squared or one over gap cubed, something like that. Um, so that's, that's very nice insight from the physics world. But this is a great example of where uh, the theoretical insight and the actual engineering uh, implementation, there's a, there's a distinction between them. So in the, in the real world, once you've built a system and you have a problem, then the real problem you're trying to solve is, suppose I'm gonna give you a thousand seconds of runtime, then is the right thing to do to run a very small number of very, very slow anneals in that thousand seconds? or should you run a tremendously large number, millions of very quick anneals? And the physics world would tell you, the slower the anneal, the better. But in fact, you know, if you actually include all of the real uh, you know, physical effects in the real device, it turns out that we have a much higher success probability if we run a large series of shorter anneals. So you know, this is a great example where um, you can have a theoretical framework that gives you partial insight into a device. But by the time you actually build a physical device, you calibrate it and you, you make it operational, it turns out that the operational characteristics 
include other effects that actually may dominate the uh, the effects that, that the physicists think they understand. And so from my point of view, that's why it's incredibly important to actually build these devices and measure their performance, because they're going to reveal things that we don't understand from a theoretical basis. Great. And on that, uh, we have come to the end of our time. Uh, there are lots of questions regarding uh, use of ocean and creating cubos and LEAP. So I encourage everyone to go take a leap, uh, take a look at our website and you can go sign into LEAP and get some free time. There's lots of tutorials and videos and other ways to learn and there's a very vibrant community of people that can uh, support you as you go through this learning process. So thanks very much. Um, we will make, uh, I will send an email out to everyone so you know where you can access the recording of this and uh, get the slides as well. So thanks so much and uh, stay tuned. We will we're doing these webinars monthly, so we will send you information about what's coming up. Thanks and have a great day.